Hello everybody, welcome back to another CSS Twitch stream. Today we're going to talk, be talking about tables. And tables are one of those things that are difficult on a good day. They're easy to make a standard desktop table. We, we know how to style those. But where it gets a little interesting is how do we make them work well with um, once we're on mobile. So that's what we're going to look at today. So if I go to our code, let me cut over. There we go. We're looking at this, uh, still looking at the same DevSpace website. And um, so far, there's no tables on this particular page. But if we look at our code, we will see that over here, I'm going to give us a little bit more room. We can see that over here, we have this ticket prices table that's been commented out um, because it's not particularly relevant right the second for the conference but it will be when t tickets for next year goes on sale so we want to make sure that that is properly styled for them so we are going to go ahead and uncomment that out so that we can go ahead and have this table and take a look at it so i'm going to delete that we still want that article tag though. Definitely still want that article tag. And we're going to get rid of that. Okay. And we're going to save. And so now we should have, once I refresh, we have a table somewhere on this page. There we go. It's over here at the bottom. And right now it's completely unstyled. We have some bolds and some italics. So my guess is that we have some inline styles going on and we do lots of them. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of those inline styles because we want to make sure that our styles are being controlled from our style sheet. Uh, that way, if we do ever have another table somewhere else, they go ahead and happen to have our styles as well. So we're going to get rid of all that. <clears throat> Pretty much personally, the only time I end up using inline styles are if I want something to be able to load really, really fast. So, uh, for example, Angular has a loader at the very beginning, you know, when the, the actual application is loading. I'll do inline styles on that layout. Um, and I'll do inline styles if I'm toggling something via JavaScript, for example, if it's dynamic. But those are the few instances where um, I will go ahead and do inline styles. Generally speaking, if it's something static, it's going to go in a style sheet. So now we have our basic table. Um, so our first, what was happening before, is our first column was bold, and then our available until was italics. So we're, we want to make sure that we recapture that. So we have a class of info. That's good. And so we're going to say we're going to do some base styles for tables, and then we can do some special things based on the fact that this is a class of info. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say for my tables, I want them to definitely be width 100 percent. And then I'm going to switch views because I essentially want to style just like we did the header and the mobile and the nav and everything else. I want to go ahead and style this to handle uh, mobile view first. So I'm going to make us really, really small. And then I'm going to scroll down to our table. There we go. It's somewhere. It's over here. There we go. And we're going to handle it here. Now, what's interesting about this table is actually it works pretty well. Even if I left it as a table, it is small enough that it might actually handle decently even on mobile. Um, so we may not do anything too funky. Um, let's see. Yeah. Once we add padding and everything, it'll still not be ideal. So in order to make this work on mobile, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that our table has headers, which it definitely does not. Um, so in this case, the headers aren't necessarily our columns, but our rows, each rows, this first thing right here, this 
should really be an, a header or a th because that way it tells us that this is going to be the what determines what the row is talking about right and in this case the scope for a header is the row and so this is important because it'll tell assistive technologies what the structure of our table is so it'll tell our assistive technology users how to interpret the table because as a sighted user i can look at the table and just know okay it's a table it's got three columns this is what's going on if um if i can't see the table it's a lot harder to differentiate that so this didn't change a whole lot other than now our headers are styled like headers and we still have our three columns so the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and say that we are going to go ahead and deconstruct the table a little bit from a css standpoint i'm going to make this table actually act more like cards for each of the prices and then go back and um once we're in, in desktop sites reconstruct it back into a table so i'm going to say that our I'm going to take our rows, so our TRs, oh, we're in plain old CSS, not SAS, TR and our THs and our TDs. And I'm going to say that these are going to be a display block. Now we are starting to have something going on. And now for each of these prices, now we can style this into something a little bit more card-like, right? So I'm going to take our, I don't mind this first one being bold. Um, our headers being bold is not terrible. Uh, and, but we definitely want to give it some breathing rooms. So I'm going to take our rows, so our TR, and we're going to give it a margin, margin bottom of one rem. Because now we're in display block, we can do that. We could totally not get away with doing that on a uh, on a table, but we can because we've set display blocks. We lose the fact that it's a table in this case. And so now that we have a margin, we're going to have a little bit more space, and then we're going to give it make maybe make it look a little bit more card like. So we're going to give it a box shadow. See, that might be a little excessive for this case. I'm just going to give it a border bottom. And remember, last week we ended up making that super cool um, linear gradient border image. We're going to do the same thing to keep consistency in our UI. So I'm going to take this border. So border, bottom, style let's say 1px and then border image that's where our gradient comes in oh, I think I have it twice I do have it twice and we still need a border type so border bottom type solid now last time oh huh, style is solid that's what i'm doing style is solid width is what we need for the 1px my bad okay so last time we had a, we put a, uh, we made it rotate, right? We put a 45 degree in our angle because we were going all the way around the box. In this particular case, we're not going to want the degree because I'm just putting a line underneath each of the sections. So we're not going to want that, that curve. We're going to want the gradient to go from light to dark or from dark to light. We're not going to want the, the diagonal. So I'm going to go ahead and take, see this 45 degrees, I'm going to take it out because that'll make it linear uh, from left to right. 
should be anyway. It might be top to bottom. I don't remember. If that's the case, we'll fix it. So see, we're going from light to light. I can't tell. Let's add a 50. Let's add a, let's add a, instead of 50, we're going to do, so half of 360 is 180. Actually, we want 90, maybe, because we want to turn it 90 degrees. That makes more sense. I liked it better before. So we're going to leave it straight up from left to right. Okay. So we now have our linear gradient. Now the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to go and this still doesn't look ideal with this title. Um, so we're going to see about giving that our primary color. So our TH, right, because it's a header, I want to go ahead and give it a color of bar. And remember, we have everything in color variables. So that's super cool. I don't have to remember my hexes. Cool. And let's see about doing a font weight, something not quite as accentuated. Let's do a font weight of maybe 500. See if it'll take that. That looks very much like the rest, so let's do six. There we go. So not quite as bold as before, but still definitely accentuated. And now we still need to, we still want to make sure that this disclaimer, right, is available and is in italics like it was before. But we only want to do it for this particular table. This is something that's specific to this table. So I'm going to give this table a class of ticket prices. And I'm going to say that my dot ticket prices. And so we want to specifically select, I don't want to have to write a class every time. So I want to specifically select this last cell every time. So I'm going to say TR. So of the table ticket, class ticket prices, TR, TD, last of type. I want a uh, font variant. Um, is it a text? This is, I can never remember how to do an italics. Font style. There we go. Italic. And so this specifically selects the last cell out of every row, right? So if I go back over here, yeah, we're saved. There we go. And now we are, in fact, <clears throat> italicized. So the last piece we're going to need is to give these a little bit more breathing room ver uh, vertically, right? Um, so we're going to give our TDs. There we go. A little bit of margin. And the reason I use margin is because margin between elements can collapse. And so if I say a margin of 0.5 rem, because these two elements are blocked, are display block, it's not going to do 0.5 rem plus 0.5 rem. The two margins are going to collapse to just being 0.5 rem, which is what I want in this particular case. We still probably want to start our table. So we have line between each to give us our, you know, for each of the categories, we probably want one at the very top as well. So over here where we have our TR gradient on the border bottom, right? We probably also want to do TR first of type, not the very first of our table, our first TR 
I'm going to give it a border. I'm going to copy basically all of this over, not the margin, all of the border information. Except I'm going to change all of these bottoms to same top. Border image stays the same. And so now that first one also has a top. And why is it not blue like the rest of them? That's interesting. Top, top. Image. Hmm. It's already being assigned. No point in assigning it twice. That is weird. Border top style, border top. Oh, hang on. Nope. Hmm. That is very interesting. What if I do my tabletop? If I just say on the table. Find out if it's a. Hmm. I wonder why it's not taking the linear gradient. That is very interesting. I will have to look into that. Okay. <clears throat> I'll look into that offline because that's one of those weird things to debug. Alright, so the last thing we need is we do need a little bit of padding over here. So the same way we put padding on our TD, we kind of want that on our TR as well. And our TH as well. Make sure it's got some, a little bit of breathing room as well. Okay, so now we have something that looks nice on mobile, but as you can see on desktop now, that's a little overkill, right? We don't need to be doing all that jazz. We can go and make this a normal table again. So to make it a normal table again on, on mobile, I'm gonna take in our media query, we're gonna start rebuilding the table. So the same way we said that, see these three, we did a display block. These need to go back to being, to behaving and displaying just like tables. So we're going to say, are, I'm going to paste this so we don't remember, forget any of them. So our TR gets a display of table row. Our TH gets a display of table, table. It's header, it's cell. There we go. And same with our TD. It's also a cell. And now we can get rid of that because I just put that to make sure that we didn't forget anybody. So now it should start behaving much like a table again. There we go. Now we need to give that some borders and some margins and some paddings and some <clears throat> fun stuff, right? So we're definitely going to do a, I'm going to put this just in general on tables because it's a good thing to have. Let me say border collapse. Uh, 
I'm going to regroup these so that we don't have it. Random table things floating in multiple places. Cool. We now have a table. So let's give ourselves some padding. So now I do have to use padding. Margin no longer works. So TH and TD. We're going to need some padding. And now I'm going to align these to the left uh, because having this jagged makes it super hard to read. So text align. And now we have a pretty table even for, for, for desktop and for mobile. So if I do an inspect, no, not a page source, an inspect. All right, and we go to our table. Where's our table? Too far, too far, too far. There we go. We can see that on mobile, we have something that looks nice. And then if I put this in responsive mode, that way we can shrink and play with the size, we can see that our table behaves nicely as it should. Cool. Okay. One thing I noticed while we were playing with this, and then get out of this mode, what that what I was playing with this is we can we have something going on with our buttons. We had set them up nicely, and now we have this being dark and this not playing nicely. And so I think that somewhere when we were setting up some buttons. Um, we have some scoping that crept or that overrode some things where it was not supposed to. So let's go find out why these buttons have dark text over here because that's definitely not legible. So this is our, these are just our normal, this is our form button and this is our nav button. So our buttons in our are probably in our master CSS because they're very standard things. Here's our button. And we had a button primary probably somewhere. Planning solid. Bar primary, bar primary con. Trust not disabled. So where's our blue coming from? Is our primary contrast color just wrong? Let's find out. Primary contrast is definitely white. That's not it. So where is it getting that from? That's interesting. Primary contrast is definitely white. I wonder if it's not liking the fact that I just simply typed in white. Let's try doing it as a actual. Not that it changes a whole lot. That was not it. So why? If I look at the computed. Background color, regular color. Where are you coming from? What? Uh, 
Fahrzeug kaputt. Make sure it's nothing. What I'm doing right here is making sure that the issue is actually with this variable instead of with the color itself or with something overriding it. Something's definitely overriding it. Hmm. Interesting. This is the pleasure of CSS. Okay, so it's definitely a primary contrast that's not working correctly. Does it not like having a dash? I don't remember dashes being a problem, but let's find out. I mean, I've put dashes and stuff repeatedly before. I don't see where that would be. Primary contrast, it is set on the body. Did I typo it? Maybe. Let's take that just for good measure and we will copy paste. And if that doesn't work, we will chuck it up to I need to figure out what's going on offline because the dashes inside should totally work. Where are my buttons? Primary contrast. Nope, that didn't change anything. And the reason that I know that um, that the, it works with the dashes inside is because our hover totally works. If I go back over here and our hover um, has a dashes and has a dash in the middle. Well, now it worked. So maybe it was a typo situation because now it totally works. Awesome, we fixed it. So the next piece we're going to look at is some forms. Try to clean some stuff up. This form, once I get into some wider screens, as you can see, starts having some behavior um, that I don't particularly care for. One of the things I would like to do is make sure that the label is above the input field and then that the that there's you know breathing room and to make sure we're doing the appropriate uh, validation because right now if I click here and I click, I can totally try to click subscribe and it will actually try to do things even though I do not have any of the prerequisite information in there. And it actually takes me to somewhere else where I can subscribe for MailChimp. So, and I don't see if it's keeping that information. Let's find out if it keeps that information. I'm going to insert some info. I'm going to hit subscribe. Let's find out. It did totally keep that information. So in order not to necessarily move to dev space, let's go ahead and, especially since this says required, I should definitely not be able to subscribe if I didn't fill this out, right? So let's go ahead and do some work on this form to make it a little bit more intuitive and to work, work a little bit better. And if we have time, we'll also hit up this login page, which also has some forms and some things we can do there. Um, because as you can see, we have a login or register situation over here and a forgot password all the way. There's my arrow there, all the way over here. So we'll go ahead and fix that. So back to the home page. Let's finish up on the home page. Oh, I had contract instead of contrast. Yeah, it's not actually the first time I've made that mistake in this project alone. Um, so that may happen again. Okay, so to fix this form. The first, we have some input things that we've already styled, right? 
somewhere in here, we have these input. The, I'm going to go ahead and add, because inputs, text areas, and selects are generally going to be inlined. Um, they are not, uh, or inline block. They're, they're kind of their weird thing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say they're display block. And that they are with 100% of the room they have. And if I ever want them to be not as big, I will handle those case by case. But for now, I want them to be as wide as they are. Cool. That already makes our input, our form look a whole lot better. Now it's just a matter of giving it some validation and some breathing room. So under my inputs, I'm going to give a margin, bottom, let's say one yet. Uh, let's say one rim. Cool. Sweet. So now we're looking a little bit better. And now let's look at the structure of how these labels versus input fields are being created. So I'm going to go to our form, which is in the side nav, I think. Let's look at the structure. Now, whether it's left or right, I don't remember, so we'll have to find it. Begin MailChimp sign up. There we go. Perfect. We landed directly on it. Input type email, value, name, class required. Email, like we don't need that anymore. And we'll keep the ID. Field group. We don't need this. We don't need this. We don't need this. We definitely don't. Oh, uh, we do need the four. That is to join the label and the input so that the label and the input um, are grouped together. We don't need that. Name, class, we don't need that. Response, okay. Position absolute left. My guess is this has a point and a value, so we're not going to nuke it. This position absolute left negative 5,000 pixels in tab index negative one um, is needed. Oh, look, it's uh, do not remove the sister Rick's from seven. It's a honeypot. That is what that is. That is the honeypot. So this is a field that's specifically there for the purposes of if a bot goes and tries to fill out this form, it's going to find this. It's not, it's going to find this field It's going to type something in it. And then it's going to get rejected. A human will never be able to find it because it's a position absolute out somewhere often left, literally left field somewhere off screen. And it's got a tab index of negative one, so you can't tab to it as a human you via normal interaction. So it's there to prevent bots. So we're definitely going to keep, keep that. And I'm actually going to add a so if shows visibility hidden. So should somebody accidentally stumble on it, they wouldn't even be able to see it. And then clear. So class clear, we don't need this class clear, class name, definitely not. Type submit, value subscribe, name subscribe, ID, class button. Cool. So all that is awesome. The one thing I am going to add on here that is not currently on here and to help things like last passes, not that it really matters for a sign up form, but uh, and unless you have those preset, it's going to do an autocomplete. Autocomplete. And this is going to be the email. And here we're going to do an autocomplete for name. For, so this is your first name. So it's the given name. 
And this is autocomplete last name. So that's the family name. And that should help a little bit with accessibility. And so even though I did all of these things, in theory, this hasn't changed a bit. Now what, what I'm going to try to do is disable this button if the form doesn't validate. Okay, so what I'm going to do is the subscribe. I want it to be disabled if the form isn't valid. So we're going to write a little bit of JavaScript. I know my nemesis. And I'm going to do this very horrible thing that we've been doing, which is add the JavaScript straight in here and I will go clean it up later. So I'm not bouncing between 50 screens. So. We're going to find this, this form, right? Actually, we should be able to do an auto validate because it has required and everything. I may not need to do it in JavaScript. Does this actually say required on it? Okay. So this label says it's required. However, our form does not say it's required. So now that I do that, it won't disable the button, but what it will do is if I try to submit, let's say I just put my first and last name and I remove that, it should, no, it still took me. Because HTML has an auto validation system. Let's look it up because I don't remember exactly how this works. HTML auto validate or prevent submit. No, not Facebook. That's not going to help me much. And I'll definitely do it in Chrome. No, I don't want to disable validation. I specifically want to put it in. There you go. Mm -hmm. Validation. Yeah. Required min max patterns. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Chrome, and this may be behavior specific to Chrome, so maybe we don't want to necessarily... There we go. That's what I'm looking to do. See how this one will just automatically do it. One more step. Hmm. So it's doing it here and we have a form and we have its action, we have its method and a name and a target and we have a no validate and that is why it's not validating. There we go. So now If I try to do the same thing I did before, it should yell at me. And it does. Perfect. Awesome sauce. Okay. But however, on the flip side, since these two are not required, I should be able to go ahead and subscribe. It's already subscribed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's, is it going to force, I'll give him um, the same email address, there you go. Is it going to let me do that? Yep. 
so it does not require the name and the username, which is perfect. Awesome. Okay. So now we have something that's a little bit more, if it's going to say required, I'm going to make it required. Awesome. So what do we still have over here? This is interesting that this sidebar is still around when the other one is not. There's where our subscribe goes. And that sidebar never comes back. This sidebar should be coming and aligning itself right here. Let's fix that. It's the Twitter sidebar. So it's in Twitter is definitely in the when the same sidebar. So we don't need the script. Let's get rid of that. We are in the same. Section, left sidebar, article, article. Inspect. I think today, no matter what I try to show you, this particular layout is going to argue with me. Mm, it is not being put in our side. That is very interesting. Why is it not being put in our side? Because our section. Okay, let's find our side. Ooh. Include left, include right. Hmm. Is there an include Twitter somewhere I should know about? No. Debugging, debugging. Twitter, Twitter goes and looks for what? Yes, it's definitely cooking for. That's Twitter. That should be an H2. That has to do with the templating somehow not behaving the way I understand it to behave. So this is interesting. If I look at another page where I haven't messed with the layout, that's sometimes a, a good way to debug these things is to look at a page where you haven't messed with the layout. Inspect. How is it setting this up? We are looking at our input, cool, our form, our clear, our new article, and our section. Okay. So why is it not doing the same here? We have our article, and it is adding it outside. That sidebar. That's very interesting. I wonder. I wonder if it's because it has these. No.
Twitter, LMFAAB, ABS, blah, blah, blah. Script, Twitter, WG, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That is weird. Okay, I will debug that offline. Let's save that out. Okay, so we are starting to look pretty good. We also have this right timeline, which should probably go in our side and obviously is not regardless of the fact that I told it that it needed to be in our assign. So that is working or in our side, so that's working beautifully. Um, maybe if I give it, I wonder if some things are white space specific. So let's find out if that's the case. It is not the case. Awesome. Why? Now I'm now now I'm really curious because here's what's going on. We have our left sidebar and our left right sidebar that are in this aside, and we have our main main body. Articles, we have our dev space. Where's main start? Main starts here. Main ends here. Then everything else after this table should be getting dumped in that aside. And it is woefully ignoring the aside except for the mailing list, which is the first one in the lot. Maybe if I give it an extra div. Wouldn't be the wouldn't be the weirdest thing to ever happen. We got yelled. We got yelled at. And, oh yeah, earlier, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that still did not fix it. I'm not sure why. I will have to look. Um, I would have to. I'm gonna have to look up this templating system a little bit closer to see what's going on with that. So let's move on to what you actually came for, which is some actual CSS and not me drawing the debug. Why this isn't putting the components where they belong because this totally does work nicely in theory. Okay, so we have a nice page. We have all of our, we have call to sponsors nicely done. We have ticket prices nicely done. We'll get some images in here. Let's look at the next page. Let's find out what's going on here. We have sessions, okay. So same thing, we're gonna have our, we're gonna have a main and an aside so that we can have our sidebar with our mailing list and our Twitter and our sponsors and our PayPal. And then we're going to be able to see, we have the call for speakers now open. Uh, we can make that a call to action. So what you're gonna see is that all of that setup stuff that we've done in the previous weeks, now we're just gonna be able to give class names and set up some class and set up some um, some structure and that will uh, basically fall right into place and we're not going to have to write a whole bunch of CSS so let's see if we can't knock out the session page really quick so sessions sessions let's see there's multiple files called sessions so not 100% probably this one. Yep. Okay. So the first thing we had done in our index was separate that main and that aside. So we're going to do that again. Oh, 
all the way down to here. I think we had just changed that section name to main. ID content. Yeah, we had. Main. And then the side. And then save, and that should already start giving us our columns. Or not. Oh, because I gave it a container because of the. Yeah, yeah. Nope, not what I meant to do. Not what I meant to do. I'm already subscribed, I promise. There we go. So we have our call to speaker. Ignore this Twitter thing not placing itself where it's supposed to be. So we have our call. We now have our two columns. If we come back, we have our one column. Beautiful. We can fix some, I'm going to format document, there we go, give that a little bit better idea of what's going on. I personally like two spaces, but there we go, got a little bit more legible, format document, there we go. I think it was using tabs before. There we go. Okay. So we are going to change this to. So in this case, sessions should be our H1. We should at the very top of our body have something like H1 sessions. That's the name of our page. And then these all become H2s. So all of these become H2s h2 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 and h room time slot display time okay those are not going to be h's Again, these are data. They're not necessarily headers. So we're going to fix that here in a minute. And save. So now we, that we have a hierarchy for our page. Actually, this should go after the title. And probably get spelled correctly. Yeah, details. I'm going to put it after that. There we go. Because we don't want it before a menu, right? Our menu needs to stay at the top of the page. There we go. Sessions, call for speakers, speakers from last, sessions from last year. Perfect. And so now, as I go through, right, all I'm having to do is add our class lists, add our, because we've based everything and we have our base styles everywhere, we can go ahead and do that. So let's see, call for speakers now open. Call for speakers, that option, we give a class call to action, right, which we set up last week. And whoop, we have a call to action. And we can add a button at the at the bottom to, you know, because on the on the home page we had the button underneath. So if I go to our home, I can even copy it straight from there. Our call to actions were down here. Sponsor, sponsor, speaker. Oh, we never made one for the speaker. That's okay. We'll make it here. Copy paste much? No.
There we go. So this little bit is more introducing, you can see if you're still not ready to commit, this is more introducing the next section. So this probably just goes, where's our list of sections? There we go, sessions from the previous years. That belongs more with that because if we end up with content in between, right, this is going to get split from the information it's actually trying to uh, actually trying to introduce so we have our call to speakers still not sure you're wanting to commit previous years and there we go okay so that's pretty good for today I'm gonna go ahead and figure out this layout thing um, so that we can keep going but as you can see the rest of the site is gonna go pretty quickly as we already have a lot of our of our styles already made our styles already baked it's going to be a whole lot of applying classes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that a lot of that offline since it's going to be a lot of the more of the same and uh, keep some of the more interesting pieces because there's just still a couple things that we need to um, that we need to style. For example, on the speakers, there we go. We still have each you know these speaker cards that we're going to want to style from previous years speakers at the conference and things like that. So those are going to be a lot more fun to style than watching me apply classes everywhere. So by next time, hopefully I'll have this layout behaving them itself. And with that, I am going to bid you all a very happy coding and see you again next week. Thank you all for coming and thank you for joining me today. Have a very good rest of your week and weekend.